Hey guys, welcome back. Um, thanks for watching the last couple videos. I definitely appreciate it. And now you're uh, kind of hanging out with me all, while I'm running some errands uh, with the family here. But uh, today, uh, today's video, I want to talk about animal welfare. And I know that probably uh, shies a lot of you away, but animal wellness and welfare is something we really have to be cognizant of because it's important. It's having healthy animals, both physically and mentally. Now, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums defines animal wellness or welfare as uh, an animal or group of animals collective physical and mental states over a period of time um, and also measured on a continuum of, of good to bad or poor to, to well. Um, so while you're setting up a habitat for these guys, you need to keep that in mind. You need choices and whatnot. So today, we're not only gonna talk about that, but we're gonna get into some of the things that help encourage good animal welfare um, starting with enrichment. enrichment. Enrichment! All right, enrichment. So the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or the AZA, defines enrichment as a process by which the behavioral and physical needs of an animal are met in a species-appropriate way by offering opportunities and choices. Now, it's not as difficult as that might sound, actually. So I'm going to go through a few things that you can do at home just to kind of provide those sort of things that are probably easier than you're thinking and are likely things you're already doing with your animals. So let's move along. So if you guys recall in uh, the video number one, the Conixus enrichment, I added some Arcadia T5 Shade Dweller UVB bulbs. And they've been great. Uh, the the Conixus come out and bask in them as soon as they turn on. It's really awesome. However, they do put out a little more heat than I was anticipating, and I wanted to mitigate that as well as add some sort of um, tactile enrichment in the, in, the, in the habitat. So I used that template you see there to put in the side, and then once I put it in there, I realized I needed more holes, so I just drilled some more holes, and there's 25 holes there. Um, and then what I did is I sourced, sourced some computer fans and hooked them up to a power source. And the goal with this is um, to kick them on any time that the UVB turns on. Um, you see there, I, it works. <laughs> but it's to kick on the UV, kick these on any time the UVB turns on, uh, so that it pulls in air and kind of ventilates it. Now there are other ventilation options. This is an animal plastics habitat, so there is other uh, ventilation in there. So the air going in comes back out, but. By completing this, um, not only did was I able to add um, some ventilation and to help cool down the habitat when these lights turn on, but also adding basically what I think is wind, and it's something that these guys can feel. It moves around um, scents and things that these guys can pick up. So overall, I really like this little form of enrichment. So that was one little form of enrichment uh, that was easy for me to do, but wiring up a computer fan may be outside of everyone's comfort level, but let's take this for example. This is a classic snake fin. Um, I think everyone's familiar with it. Uh, it goes into a rack system. And what you see here is the bare minimum. You see a, a hiding area, a newspaper substrate, and a water bowl. Now physically you might be able to meet the demands of this animal, but mentally are you? Well you can, I'm sure. You know, putting in a fresh cut uh, branch with leaves on it or a flower or anything that has some sense to it might be able to mentally stimulate this animal but take a look at what I've done with the same bin uh, and I was able to add some substrate in there not very difficult to do this is a substrate of cypress coca core peat moss and then some old um, disinfected magnolia leaves now those add all kinds of a different tactile experience and olfactory experience I've also added two hide boxes one is back by the by the heat and the other one is that little uh, kind of cave there that I've covered with substrate to kind of give it a more a darker more secure area to go so I've also added you can see there's a, a strip of bark in there just to add a, even something else for this animal to smell and feel so this wasn't very difficult to do um, and actually a lot of times makes cleaning even easier because I just uh, spot clean it every now and then and uh, what I didn't show in here is that I also add some isopods to it because it's not going to hurt anything and um, it does help a little bit and it's just another form of enrichment so I think this is pretty easy to do and I'm not saying that the bare minimum is a bad thing to do um, but I am trying to encourage you through this whole channel to think about things process things 
and improve things once you know that there's other information out there to help you do that. So hopefully this is helpful. Assessments! Don't forget to assess your animal's physical and mental wellness. Well, now that you just heard my entire family yell assessment at you, uh, let me explain a little more about that. So uh, as a professional zookeeper, we do animal welfare assessments quite a bit. And basically what we're doing is we have five categories that we identify and we give it a standardized grade. Now, whether that's an A, B, C, D, F, or one through five, that's up to you. Um, but we look at the, the nutrition, the health, the behavior, the mental state, and the environment. And those five categories encompass um, the care you're giving to the animal. And I'm not saying this is something you have to do, uh, but I do think it's a useful tool to use. It's useful for us because it measures how we're doing over a period of time. So figuring this out can not show you where you're failing as a keeper of animals, but what it should do is identify areas that you can improve upon. And that's always a good thing because no one is perfect at animal keeping. We should always be looking to improve. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail about what each one of these cat categories is um, and how you can use that in your own self-assessments self if that's what you wanna do. So before I get into the categories that we're going to assess, um, I'd like to start with the grading scale. Now at work, I use a one through five grading scale. Uh, one being the poorest, five being the best. Now a five means excellence. Like you ha will have a hard time improving upon that because you're doing it so well. Um, a four means that all aspects of this particular husbandry parameter are being met. That's good, that's what you wanna achieve, uh, that's what you wanna look for, you know? Uh, a three means some aspects are of that variable are being met for that animal. A two means a few aspects are being met, and a one means nothing's being met. So you can imagine, that's not good. So if you rate something a one, two, or a three, those are all areas that you need to reevaluate and look towards improving. Doesn't mean necessarily you do anything wrong, it means that maybe the information's not out there, you didn't know, you know? So you can't make improvements if you don't know that there are improvements to be made. So recognizing areas is very important. That's why we're doing this whole thing. So a one, a two, or a three is what you wanna use uh, to identify an area that needs improvement. Now, once you go through all five categories, you have a one through five assigned for all of them, averaging that out is how I did decide what an animal's overall uh, welfare assessment is. And you really want something above, you really wanna go for that four if not higher and get a five overall, because uh, that means you're, you're spreading that welfare goodness around, you know? It's not like you're having a five on environment and then a three on everything else. That's not what you want. You want to try to equal that out, all right? So let's move on to the different categories. Alright guys, now first off, I know what you're wondering is, did you know that this lion's mane was underneath that hat? Well, it was, and here you go. Anyways, let's do a quick trial run through assessing some animals, alright? So first thing we're going to do is uh, assess health, and basically what you want to do is, uh, are you providing this animal good health, and do you have um, the ability to rapidly assess health and get veterinary care and prevent diseases? So. I do that by, uh, I have, uh, I use a, a local vet named Dr. Dalhausen, and if I have a problem, I'll go see him. So I have that vet in hand. Uh, and then to assess health, I pretty much just take uh, monthly weights of, of these box turtles. These are Florida box turtles. There's one of the females. But I get monthly weights on these guys to make sure that uh, I'm keeping track, because they should be increasing weight to a certain degree, and then it needs to plateau you don't want to see increasing weight gain or increasing or decreasing weight drop so that's health and so for health uh, you know I would give it a four is it excellent no I, I don't give myself any any fives ever but I think a four this animal is in good health I'm monitoring it I have a plan to prevent disease and I have a plan to bring this animal to uh, a vet if necessary so now we'll focus on nutrition and these guys have always had a good appetite 
Uh, I keep regular weights on them, like I said before, uh, to make sure they're not exceeding certain weight limits and that we find that uh, adult plateau of weight. Uh, but I have seeded this entire outdoor area, as you can see, with, with worms. So they always have that available availability. I also feed them a variety of vegetables like zucchini, carrots, squash, um, sweet potato, and things like that. But primarily they eat protein. Uh, one of the things I like to feed them is whole prey diet, like a, an entire adult mouse or a, an entire uh, chicken chick, because I think they're scavengers in the wild. And being able to eat that bone and the organs and everything else inside that animal is something they would do naturally in the wild. So for nutrition, uh, I would also give these guys, in my opinion, a four. So now we'll look at environment, the next variable. Uh, for about three or four months of the year, uh, these Florida box turtles have this really nice outdoor kind of area, as you can see in the video below, where there's live plants, there's a mix of substrates, uh, there's food that they can scavenge on their own, bugs, things like that, uh, as well as I'm feeding them throughout the day. Um, so for the most part, I would give these guys a four here, but let's remember that for a large part of the year, I keep them indoors, and they have a, a six foot by two foot area that they occupy in the winter, which is adequate, but not great, and I need to improve on that. So overall, I would give these guys a three uh, if you average the whole year around. So that's an area I need to improve, particularly the outdoor pool, uh, as the, it does have some room to go in uh, and, and wait around, but I think naturally they like to inhabit these large, shallow pools a little more often than I can give them. Uh, so this summer I need to improve on that, and that's what I'll be working on. Let's move on to category number four. This is behavior. Now I'm not watching these guys all the time, but I do notice regular basking, uh, eating, uh, just general movement, trying to find a shady spot to hang out. I see courting between the males and females, and occasionally I do see some slight uh, maneuvering uh, between males which is fairly natural as well, but they have plenty of space to hide and get away from everybody. So I think that is pretty good. Now again, we have to average this out with indoor. Uh, and indoor, I don't keep them all together. I split them up into, into two groups. So they have a little less room. Boy, I still see a lot of the same behaviors, but there's a little bit of less avoidance. So again, I would probably give these guys a three. They have uh, some aspects of behavior, but I need to be able to provide better options for behavioral enrichment. And now this is characterized by a predominance of positive uh, mental states. And that just means that their lives are dominated by choice and control. So when I look in here, I think that they have choices of control to go to uh, their watering hole, or they have choices to go like live somewhere else, hide somewhere else. I have three different hides that are buried so they can go underneath it and cool off. They have temperature choices, so I think the mental state seems to be pretty good. But that's just me thinking and what I need, I'm going to rate myself a three on this one because I need to do more homework, all right? I need to look more into their natural history so I have a better idea of what a positive mental state for this animal should be. So there's always room for improvement. So a three means I'm going to improve. Composite score of 3.4, which is okay, but definitely has some room for improvement, lots of room. Um, and going through, I've got a four in health, a four in nutrition, and then I gave myself a three on behavior, mental state, and environment. And the biggest drawback, the reason those are threes instead of closer to a four, is because they only spend three or four months outside and the rest of the year they spend indoor. And the outside habitat, I think, is much more conducive to all these things than the indoor. So I need to improve on how I hold these guys indoors. And that's kind of what this has shown me. And that's the point of this whole thing. It's, it's not to make you feel bad. It's just to identify areas that you can improve on. And that's what we should be doing. And it's a standardized way to do that. So if I do more assessments on these guys every year, or every couple of months, or however often you want to do it, it kind of charts my progress over a period of time and makes sure I'm keeping up with it, you know? And uh, again, this isn't something I'm saying you have to do, but now that you know about the process and some of the information behind it, hopefully it's something you'll consider using. Um, and you don't have to share the results with anybody except for yourself. 
if you don't want to, you know, you just use it as a tool to improve your husbandry. And that's, that's what this is for. So guys, thanks for sticking with me through this whole video. Um, it was a fun one, you know, and it, uh, I hope if nothing else you get out of this video is to at least think about some of these concepts and how it applies to your animals. Certainly not telling you to do anything. I'm just putting this information out there uh, and hopefully it gets the, the wheels turning and you start thinking about maybe what you can do with your stuff. So I hope you enjoyed the uh, small enrichment um, that I added on to the Conixus homiana as well as how you can change your snake tub and actually make it work a lot better than just a bare newspaper tub. Um, provide some more mental stimulation for those animals. I'd like to take this moment right now to actually nominate someone to continue this and share at least one enrichment technique they use with their animals. And I'm nominating you, Riley, of Riley's Reptiles. Uh, I nominate you and challenge you to share one concept that you use for enrichment for any of your animals and just just share it and let's create a chain of these cool enrichment techniques that others can follow and show that it's not that difficult to do uh, it just takes a little bit of thought and a little bit of time so until next time i want to thank you again for for watching if you like what you saw please subscribe like share comment do all that stuff and uh, i'll see you next week thanks a lot check out how enriched these snakes are Everywhere you look, there's a waterfall, plants, butterflies, stuff to see, feel. There's even grass in the sky. Thanks, Em, for this perfect habitat. So I can edit it away at the beginning. Okay. Ready? Wait, can you see my hand here? No, I cannot. Okay. Rolling. Can you see my hand? I, I could see it when you did that. Can you see it, Em? I'm be before I like record usually. I don't okay, know. Why. Beard looks good and we're rolling. Rolling. We're rolling? Yeah. So I should talk now? Talk now. Fix your hair first and then talk. Oh of course. These locks. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, lovely Looking locks. good.